jeez, I feel like a football team should come running out of a tunnel after that video. Just like build up, right? It's like huge build up. And like, all right, anyways. What's up, guys? All right, I'm going to be completely honest with you all. This is going to be fun. I worked last night and I got off at 6 o'clock this morning. I am not fully awake, but I am fully caffeinated, so we're going to have a good time. Uh, yeah, because I had to flip my schedule back to days, and that gets a little dicey when I sleep like three hours. So we're going to have some fun. It's going to be a good time. Uh, we are going to finish, uh, yeah, we're going to finish up this, the first half of the seven churches of Revelation. We are going to look at, wow, that is bright. Sorry. Revelation chapter two. Got to get away from that thing. Uh, and we're going to be starting at verse 12. Verse 12. So have your Bibles or if you have it on your phones, that's fine. Just be on uh, the Bible app for me. That would help me out a lot. Um, we're going to be in verses 12 through 17. And we are going to be looking at the church of Pergamum. All right, so Pergamum, here's, here's some background here. This church is in the capital of Asia Minor under the Roman uh, emperor, all right, under the Roman province uh, of Asia Minor. So they are like the hub of activity in this area. So it's a major city. It is a massive area. There's tons of people. And um, we're going we're gonna to jump right in and just read. I'm going to read in pieces, so just kind of follow with me. We're going to start in verse 12. It says, to the angel of the church in Pergamum write, these are the words of him who has the sharp double-edged sword. I know where you live, where Satan has his throne. All right, cool. That sounds like an awesome place, right? Where Satan has his throne. Like, where Satan has his throne, right? It's like, it's like a creepy place, right? So here's, here's my thing that always bugs me. When I hear uh, young people and like people my age, and they're like, "Man, the temptations that we face, the things that are going on in our lives, are just so different from past generations. They just don't get it. They just don't understand." Anyone ever felt that way? Like my parents just don't get me because they didn't have to deal with the things that I have to deal with, right? That's pretty common. If, if you're not raising your hand or you're not shaking your head, like, okay, you really do feel that way. You're just not going to say it. That's cool. I get it. But here's the problem: the Roman Empire was one of the most uh, heavily debaucherous uh, groups of people in the history of the world. Like, you could walk down Main Street of these cities of Pergamum and see exactly what you're looking at on the internet that you're not supposed to be looking at. On the street. This was a culture where they would take 12-year-old boys, like some of the, like, especially richer families, they would take like 12-year-old boys and hire a prostitute for them so they could become a man. Right? That's what, like, that's a crime in our society, right? Like, that's a crime in our culture, and it should be. But that's what's going on here. So, the reality is that we need to understand because it's so easy for us to sometimes separate ourselves from the Bible and the people that it's talking to directly and say, that doesn't apply to me because it's different. It's a different time, it's a different place. No, it's not. It's all the same stuff, it just has different wrapping paper on it. It has just different ways that we access the same sins, right? The human condition is the same. We just access it differently. And so what Jesus is saying to us, or to the church in Pergamum, he is saying to us just the same. This is a group of people who lived in a city that was full of occult worship and like paganism. And if you have any, anyone has any familiarity with paganism, um, it is, it border, it's all the way from like the like crazy to the scary, like everything in between, human sacrifice, animal sacrifice, uh, drinking of blood, I mean like all kinds of craziness, right? And there's tons of gods and all sorts of things, and that is what is going on around this church. That's what's going on in this city. There was, uh, they also would worship the emperor as a god, so like the emperor was seen and the Roman Empire was seen as a god, so they're worshiping this guy this human as a God, as well as a multitude of other gods. And there's extreme pressure to do the same. Because if you're not doing that, you're now disrespecting the God emperor, right? And they don't really take very kindly to that. So that is the background. That is what these people are in the midst of. And this is what Jesus says to them. He kind of gives two, like, uh, if you remember two weeks ago, and uh, pretty much every week, it's, hey, this is what you're doing well. This is what you're doing bad, we got to fix it, right? That's kind of the setup of all of these different passages. Here's what you're doing well, here's what you got jacked up, let's fix it, all right? So we're going to start with what are they doing well? So in verse uh, 13, I know where you live, where Satan has its throne, yet you remain true to my name. 
You did not renounce your faith in me, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness who was put to death in your city where Satan lives. So they have remained faithful in the midst of all this debauchery and sin and worship of other gods and pressure upon them to do the same. They have remained faithful to God. That's incredibly difficult, right? That's one of the reasons that we talk about uh, how important our friend group is. Because if we consistently surround ourselves with people who don't believe in, in the Bible, that believe other things, or they believe that what you think is wrong, that's going to begin to weigh on you. That's going to bring, that's going to put pressure on you. That's going to start to leak into the cracks in your life. And so it's so incredibly important who we surround ourselves with. But he says, even in the midst of all of this, you have stayed faithful to me. So we need to, we need to keep, so that's, we don't want to lose sight because we're going to talk a good bit about the things they're doing wrong. We don't want to lose sight of the really, really awesome stuff they were doing. That they remained faithful in the midst of persecution. They're one of their leaders, one of the, one of the faithful members of them. Like, so think about a person, a, a leader in Christ's fellowship getting drug out of the church and murdered right outside the church. Like, that's going to kind of rock you a little bit, right? Like, that's going to be like, ah, I don't know if I want to come to church on Sunday. Like, that's, I may or may not, I might do, let's do online church maybe. Like, we're going we're gonna, to, like, we're going to be online next week because that's kind of scary. So you have this group of people that just watched and observed one of their own be killed for his faith. The only reason he was killed was because of his faith. And now they're faced with a decision. Right? Like they now have a choice to make. Am I still going to continue outwardly expressing my faith and risk the same consequences happening to me? Or am I going to compromise and I'm going to be like, okay, I'm still going to believe it, but I'm going to kind of hide it. And I'm just going to like talk about it with my family. And we're going to like maybe put some signs up in, front of, in our front yard that says like, we're not Christians. <laughs> Don't hurt me, right? Like we're gonna have, like we're gonna have something here that maybe we're gonna start to pull back a little bit. That was the choice they were faced with, and they chose the harder decision, which we are going to continue to live outwardly of our faith. We're going to be bold in our faith. We're going to have courage in our faith, and we are not going to allow someone else to intimidate us and to use fear to suppress our faith. We are incredibly fortunate with the country we live in. I got it. We've got issues. Got it, okay? We don't need to go into all the different issues. We got issues, heard, understood. But we live in a place that we can live outwardly in our faith, and we don't risk walking down the street and having a mob come and kill us. Okay, That's not, that is not a general fear that we have in this country. But that is what these people were facing, and in the midst of that, in the face of that, they said, I'm going to continue to live outwardly in my faith. This is incredible courage and strength that they have, that we need to have the same courage and strength. Because let's be honest, there are times where God calls us to do things that are a little bit scary. Like, there's, there's times where he's going to say, I need you to go talk to that person that you don't want to talk to. And it's going to be scary. It's going to be, you're going to be nervous. Are we going to have the courage to do what he called us to do and continue to live outwardly in our faith? Or are we going to are we going to hide in the recesses in the darkness and hope that no one notices us? All right? So that's what that's what this church is doing really well. That's what they got going on for them. And uh, and that's incredible to have that kind of strength and that kind of courage. In today's world, that's what we see with the church in places like China uh, and Indonesia and, and other places like that in some of the Muslim countries where uh, the church has a choice to live outwardly in their faith and be persecuted, to be thrown in prison, to be killed, or to hide. And I am constantly amazed at their courage that they, you see time and time again that they continue to live outwardly, even in the face of their leaders being thrown in prison uh, over and over again. Anyone want to guess where the two fastest growing churches in the world are? Like, not like individual churches, like a building, but like the fastest growing group of, of Christians in the world are? China's one, Iran, China and Iran, right? The, the, the two places where they faced the greatest persecution 
It's almost like it happened in the Bible and we're seeing it all over again, right? So when we live boldly in our faith, when we live with courage, God does an amazing thing. He does amazing works and we see his kingdom grow. So let's jump into what are the, what are the issues, the next verses, what are the problems we're dealing with here? The next word, nevertheless, I have a few things against you. You have people there who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak or Balak the king to entice the Israelites to sin by eating food, sacrificed to idols, and by committing sexual immorality. Likewise, you also have those who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Yeah, there. That's one. I was thinking there was no sentence there. And the teaching of the Nicolaitans. All right. So we got two different groups of people. That they are, there are people within their midst, in their group, that are holding these two different sets of teachings. So let's break it down. Let's talk about what these two different teachings are. Are. First off, Balaam, that story is in Numbers, uh, like chapter 22 through 25, if I remember correctly. That's the talking donkey. You might remember the talking donkey, right? Okay, that's Balaam. Balaam was the one who had the talking donkey. It's an awesome story. You should definitely go read it because it's hilarious because uh, the donkey basically says, you're a moron. Stop hitting me. It's wonderful. All right, so that's Balaam. Balaam was not a Jew. Balaam was not a Christian. Balaam was a, a prophet that the king had called to him to curse the Israelites. And Balaam goes to do just that. And then every time he opens his mouth to speak, he's blessing the Israelites instead of cursing them. So then once he realizes, okay, like God's actually real, he's actually in control, but the king just offered me a ton of money and a ton of stuff to not just curse him, but to teach the king how he could get his people distracted or get the Jews distracted. So he tells them, hey, go and get your women to intermarry with their men and to influence them through that way and get them to compromise with you. Now, who's her, is, when you hear the word compromise, most people, you think of something positive, right? Like compromise is usually a good thing. I have a six-year-old. And I constantly, I have a six-year-old and an eight-year-old, and I'm constantly having to go back and forth between them, like, all right, let's find a compromise that we can both be okay with. Because you want one thing, you want the exact opposite, simply because it's the exact opposite, for no other reason than it's the opposite of what he wants. So let's find a compromise. Let's find something in the middle that we can both be okay with. That's a good thing. Right? That's a, that's a positive thing. We're, we're learning how to get along together. In marriage, incredibly important to compromise. We have to be able to look at each other's point of view and perspectives and say, okay, I may not completely agree, but we can find some middle ground here. All right, so compromise is typically referred to as a positive thing, as a good thing, and normally it is. But what he's talking about here is compromising their beliefs, compromising what they know to be true. So a compromise of opinion and desire is fine. Cool. Good thing. We should do that. That's how we get along with other people. Compromise an opinion of, and, and of desires, great. Compromise of truth, not okay. Like that's, that's no good, right? We, we, we talked about, uh, it was about a month ago, when we talked about subjective and objective truth, right? You know, anybody remember that when I was, I was here? Okay, cool. We got some people shaking nor north and south. All right, so if we have objective truth, like we have this is the truth. Like there's, there's nothing else about it. Like this is the truth. I can't come off of that and still be true in what I'm saying, right? Anything other than the truth is false, right? They, they're, they're mutually exclusive. So if I begin to compromise the truth, I am now in something that is false. And so that's what Balaam told the king is, is basically, I can't, you're not going to be able to destroy them. Like God's not going to allow that. You're not going to be able to defeat them. I can't curse them, but we can distract them. Right? Like these are God's people, so he is not going to let you overcome them completely, but we can distract them. And, if we, and he, if we begin to blend and meld our belief system and our gods and, and our rituals, and we get them to compromise the truth and start blending with that, then we can distract them. And that's the same thing that was happening here, is that concept. So it wasn't necessarily the direct teachings. It was the concept of, if we can take the occult and the rituals 
and the traditions and all the different things that we're doing over here with all the different gods and all the different sacrifices and everything we got going on, and we can kind of start blending them. Like maybe we can adopt Jesus as one of our gods, and we can convince them that like we believe in Jesus too, which is, I was actually fascinated. I learned something new like relatively recently um, that in Hinduism in the United States, uh, most Hindus acknowledge Jesus as one of their gods. Huh. So it's the exact same concept, right? Um, and so if we can start blending these, and so there's people in this church that have started to do that. They've started to compromise the truth and blend it with other teachings and other belief systems. The same thing with the, the, the Nicolaitans is there was a, an early uh, deacon in the church named Nicholas, and he came from an occult background. He came from paganism, and then he converted to Judaism, and then he converted from Judaism to Christianity. All right, and that was his journey. And he kind of would do the same thing, where basically in an attempt to talk to people from that similar background that he came from, he would try to relate to them. And he would try to kind of incorporate concepts and pieces and bits and pieces to be able to soften the conversation with someone else. And that's incredibly, so when we look at today's culture and how much our doctrine, how much of our truth we try to blend with culture. We try to blend with what is acceptable, what is the hot topic, what is common in culture. So instead of looking at the Bible and saying, okay, what does the Bible say about this topic? So how do we interact with this? We start looking at how does how do I feel about this topic? And maybe my friends that are involved in this, whether it, you fill in the blank with whatever it is, right? And my friends that are in, in this, that I like, that I love, that I care about, and, and maybe how do I start softening my beliefs to more mold and meld with them? And that's the compromise that he's talking about. So they have, they have made a compromise for whatever reason. They may have been good reasons, but they have compromised the truth to blend in with our culture or with their culture of the day. The real question here that I think we have to ask ourselves is what have we compromised? What have you compromised in your life, in your spiritual walk, to better fit in with culture, to be accepted by culture, to be liked by someone in school. Maybe you've compromised the way you speak, the words you use, the tones you use, how you, how you talk around friends. That when someone hears you talk with friends and then they see you like at church, like, that oh, doesn't add up. They hear the jokes you tell and the profanity coming out of your mouth. They go, that doesn't seem to add up because you've compromised that piece to fit in. Maybe we've compromised or we started to meld our views on sexual morality. And it's like, well, maybe if I can do like, I can do like A, B, and C as long as I don't do D, right? As long, like, I, can, I can do these things as long as I don't do this one. And we can kind of start like melding them together and put a blanket of Christianity over it and say, well, well God says like, don't do this, but I think that's really more referring to like this one specific act. So I can do these, all these other things as long as I don't do that. And we kind of cloak a blanket of Christianity over it because that makes us feel more comfortable. It makes us fit in. And we compromise on that. Maybe it's over. Maybe God's cool if I pursue money as long as it's not like really bad and egregious. And like, as long as the culture wouldn't say that I'm greedy. Right? Because what's greedy in the eyes of society is very, very different than what the Bible would call greedy. So as long as I don't look greedy to the outside world, I can pursue the love of money and still be okay. We make these compromises. And what's going to take courage and what's going to take actual thought and time and prayer and conviction is what have you compromised? Like where in your life, and let's be, let's like, let's be honest, let's be legit, everyone has made a compromise. Like, there's, there's no one sitting here today that is a believer that's like, no, I don't think I, no, I haven't done any of that. 
Never have I ever. That, that's, not, it's just, that's not the case. So what compromise have you made to fit in with the people around you, to, to be more uh, softer to culture so that you can begin to meld and blend what you believe with what culture says is acceptable and okay? So what does it say to do with that? Right? It's like, okay, so now let's acknowledge we've all made compromises wherever it is. We need to be able to acknowledge that. So what do we do with it? Like, are we just lost now? Or like, is it just gone? And he says no. So in verse uh, 15, sorry, 16, repent therefore, otherwise I will soon come to you and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. So it's, if we click back to uh, verse 12, the very beginning, where it says, the words of him who has a sharp, double-edged sword. He's talking about the word of God, the Bible. The word that he's given us is a double-edged sword. What is a sword used for? To separate things. Right? To, to literally cut and separate things. Sometimes it's a limb from the body, right? In a, in a combat environment. But it is, it is designed, it is there to separate things. And so what he's saying is if we don't repent, if we don't turn and go the other way with this, if we don't stop compromising, if we don't break these bonds of the compromises we've made, then he will come and he will fight and he will separate us from his people. That's a, that is a... That is a scary thought. Like that is a le- that is something we should legitimately fear. We should have a healthy fear of what he's saying here. Is that he says, "I will come and fight against those who do not repent from these teachings." And we will be separated from him. We remember we talked about the human condition at the beginning. We cannot lose sight of the human condition. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and the wages of sin is death. That's it. Period, point blank, that's it. Right? There's, no, uh, there's nothing else there. Like, that is the human condition. That is what we have earned. That is what we deserve is eternal death separated from Christ. That's what we've got going for us on our own account. Because when he talks about the next piece of it, when he says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna. That is eternal life. That is everlasting life. That is in paradise. I will also give him a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to him who receives it. That's what he, that is a, a way of him saying, you will be entered into the gates of heaven. You will be with him in paradise for all of eternity. You will have eternal life. You will have joy. You will have fulfillment. You will have all these things if you will repent and come back to me. But if you don't, there is a sword that will cut you off from me. And so often... I, I've seen this in my own life. I've seen this when I did student ministry for 10 years. I see this in the culture every day that I work in. That when we, we get, we have to be convinced ourselves that it is more loving to not upset somebody. It is more loving to not have a hard conversation with someone that might get them mad. Because when we talk to someone about the gospel, we don't know what their response is going to be. And especially if we're talking to someone who proclaims Christianity, but their life shows absolutely nothing, no fruit whatsoever. And we go to them and say, hey, man, um, you've said these things, but nothing in your life shows it. And I am concerned about you. I am concerned about your eternal soul, and let's talk about it. They could get really upset about that. They might. Is it more loving to not have that conversation because we don't want to upset them? We have convinced ourselves that that is more loving and caring, to accept them as they are. Here's the problem. We went hiking this past week. My family and I uh, went on a vacation, and we were in Big Bend and some other national parks. And we went on this one really cool hike. And, and we went into this, uh, like, canyon area. But you had to climb over some pretty dicey rocks. And there was one point where the trail goes up, and we're, like, kind of on a cliff face sort of deal, and it bends to the left. But for some, I guess enough people had gone to the right to the edge to take pictures that there was, like, this little foot trail off to the right to the edge of the cliff. So if I'm walking with someone, 
and I know the real path, the real trail bends to the left and goes up this way, up the mountain and into the canyon, and this one looks like a path. It looks the same, but it goes right to the edge of the cliff, and if you continue walking on it, you're going to go into the cliff. Is it more loving for me? If that person is completely convinced that this is the right path, they are 100 completely convinced. They are going to argue with me that this is the path, this is the trail. I'm not getting off of it. Is it more loving for me to not say something that's going to upset them and get them off of this path that's walking off a cliff to get them on the right path? Or is it more loving for me to grab them by the collar and drag them onto the path that's going to keep them safe? I would argue that it is more loving to step into a space that might upset someone to keep them on the path of life than to allow them to walk down the path of death. And that is the reality that we face in the human condition. And we have to have that in our minds. We have to break this shield that we put over our faces that it's all going to be okay, that we can all just live happy, we can all just be good people, as long as they're spiritual, as long as they're good outweighs the bad, everything's going to work out in the end. That is not what the Bible says. So if we believe the Bible to be true, which I do, we have to face the reality that many people that are walking alongside of us are walking down the path that leads off the edge of the cliff. And I contest it is more loving to step into that space in an appropriate way. I am not advocating for shouting at people and fire and brimstone. Please don't hear that. Not advocating for that. What I'm advocating for is that we love people so well that we've built such a deep relationship with them that they're willing to hear our heart of care and love for them to push them down the path that leads to life instead of allowing them to continue to walk down the path of naivety towards death. That's what this passage is talking about, is we cannot make these compromises of truth and culture. We can't intermix those two. There's, there's no movement from truth. If it is not true, it is false. It is a binary thing. It is black, it is white, it is true, it is false. That's it. There's, there's none, no more that we can sit here and go, man, maybe a, maybe a little bit of that. Or if we would just like, cha- if our church would just change their teaching just a little bit, then we would get more people to show up. People would want to be here more. They would feel better when they were here. Guys, it's not about feeling better. It's about knowing the truth so that we can be fulfilled. That's what Jesus is talking about to this church today. So the challenge before us is, is answering two questions. Number one, where have you compromised? Number two, what are you going to do about it? Are we going to identify it and go, like, yeah, but I kind of like that and continue to walk that path? Or are we going to actually do what the Bible says and says repent? We're going we're gonna to identify it, we're going to confess it before the Lord, and we're going to turn the other direction, and we're going to go do something different. We're going to follow truth. Those are the two questions that we need to identify, that we need to ask ourselves, where have I compromised, and what am I going to do about it? Because the consequences are very, very real. And we can't blind ourselves from that. That would be unloving to ourselves to act like there's not consequences to this. I'm going to pray for us, and I'm going to let you get to your small groups and and dive into those conversations and give you all time to do that. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for your truth that we uh, have access to the truth, that we don't have to wonder, we don't have to guess. God, convict us of where we have compromised, where we have taken your truth and we have muddied it because of our own personal feelings, our desires, our opinions. God, lead us back to you. Lead us back to the truth that we would know you more. And that we could help others find and follow you. In your son's name we pray. Amen. All right, y'all. Have-